Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. And please silence your phones if you haven't already done so. My name is Joanne Davidson. Uh, I've been a member of this congregation since March of 1984. And in, <laughs> and in those 38 plus years, um, I have had uh, an unadulteratedly valuable experience being a part of this congregation. Um, I have learned so much. I have been involved in religious education. So I've, I've watched a couple of um, groups of children grow up. Um, I've been treasurer. I've been on the board. I've been uh, volunteering at the soup kitchen and at the homeless shelter. Um, through all those years. And, uh, but most of all, what I wanna say, and I, I always take this opportunity to say how much I love all you people, <laughs> because this is a wonderful group of people. I have felt valued, I have felt accepted, I have felt at home. And second to my family, this is the most important um, group that I have ever been a part of. So thank you all very much. Um, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury has been gathering together for 200 years. And as we work to build a more just world, we respectfully acknowledge that our physical building is on the traditional land of the Pawgusset people. I am so glad that you are able to join us this morning because you are an essential part of our celebration today. Whether today is your first or thousandth Sunday in our midst, in person or online, we are stronger because you are with us. If you're new to our community and joining us online, we invite you to introduce yourself and where you are connecting from in the chat box as you are comfortable. At the conclusion of today's service, you will have the chance to participate in a breakout group for individual connections and deeper check-ins. If you are new and here in person, please fill out a visitor card at the table near the exit before you leave today and consider staying for a few minutes after the service for coffee and conversation. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. Now, I have a couple of announcements. Um, today, we welcome Reverend Barbara Peskin as our guest speaker. Reverend Barbara is a Unitarian Universalist minister, retired. She has served churches in Oak Park and in Evanston, Illinois, and Connecticut, where she served this congregation from 1988 to 1995. And I have to add that I have wonderful memories of Barbara's time with us, and you are in for a treat. Uh, together, Women Rise will meet tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. The meeting will include a potluck dinner featuring cuisine of Morocco. For more information, contact Judy Lacker or Ann Krieg. And also, please check your order of service for other announcements. Again, welcome to the UU Congregation of Danbury.
Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. If we could just take a moment and turn around and wave and smile at our good friends on Zoom. You are very much part of what we do here, so thanks for Zooming by. And if you would like to take a moment now and just uh, greet, greet your, uh, your neighbors around you, that would be terrific. Oh. Okay, so I did put out a few books today for those of you who would like to sing along. I did put out a few books today for those of you who would like to sing along. Our hymn of welcome is number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. And so there are a few uh, instructions for this song since it is around. Those of you on that side of the room will go first. I'll bring you in and then this side will come in. Just follow me and play along. And those of you on Zoom, pick apart any part. <laughs> Love is the spirit of this congregation, and justice is its light. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to speak and speak the truth in love, to help each other, and celebrate life. Good morning. It is good to be together. I'm not able to be in the fellowship hall with you today because I do have COVID, but let us say together our Unison Children's Affirmation. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. The story I'm going to tell you this morning is a traditional Dataka tale from the Buddhist tradition and a quick note that there is a reference to a banyan tree in this story and a banyan tree is also known as the Bodhi tree. Here is the story. Kings come in all shapes and sizes. A true king, however, would not just be known because of the crown on his head, you could put your hands on your head with me, but because he is compassionate. Put your hands on your heart with me. In one kingdom, there lived a human king who loved to hunt. Every day he rode out from the palace through fields tended by farmers into the woods where he killed a deer for his nightly meal. During their hunt, the king's horse and those of his hunting companions ripped up the earth with their hooves. 
destroying the crops the farmers depended on for their livelihood. The farmers grew desperate. They decided that since having the king go to the deer was destroying their fields, they would instead bring the deer to the king. They built a large park next to the palace filled with grass and ponds, everything the deer needed to live. Around it, they built a high fence. Then the farmers surrounded the forest, creating a thick wall and beat the bushes and grass to drive most of the deer out of the forest and into the constructed park through a gate that they then closed. They said to the king, Oh, great king, we have built a special park for you, much closer than the forest. We have stocked it with grass and water and filled it with the deer you love to hunt. The king was thrilled. Daily, he hunted in this new park. Over time, he became familiar with the deer there and noticed that two stags seemed different from the rest. They had golden horns. You can show horns with me too. And a regal bearing. He named these the two kings and told his hunting companions that they, are, they were not to be hunted. The two stags were indeed kings. One was named Branch because his antlers branched out mightily and he was the head of a herd of 500. The other also head of a herd of 500 was named Banyan, perhaps because his antlers resembled the Banyan tree. Some remember that this happens to be a Buddhist tale and as it happens that it was underneath the Banyan tree that the Buddha reached enlightenment. And in fact, this deer was a Buddha in deer form. Both deer kings watched as their fellow deer were killed each day. Yet the killing was not the worst of it. In the new park, when the deer ran away from the hunters, they often ran into the fence or into each other and badly hurt themselves. And always when they were hunted, they were filled with fear. Their suffering was hard for Branch and Banyan to witness. One day Branch and Banyan came, Branch came to Banyan and suggested that instead of being hunted, each day one deer should present itself to the king's butcher block to be killed. Since one deer a day would die anyway, Banyan agreed. From that day forward, that is what happened. On one day, a deer from Branch's herd would present itself to be slaughtered. The next day, a deer from Banyan's herd would do the same. One day, a young doe from Branch's herd was the intended kill. She pleaded with Branch, please don't send me to die yet. My baby is too small to care for itself. And without me, it will die. Let me go and I promise to go at a later time when my baby is older. <coughs> But Branch said no. Desperate to keep her baby alive, the young mother approached Banyan with her dilemma. Banyan said, go home to your baby. Another deer will die today. That day, Banyan presented himself at the butcher's block. When the butcher saw that it was one of the golden deer, he ran to get the king. The king approached Banyan and said, why are you here? Don't you know that I ordered that you would never be killed? Go home. I cannot, Banyan replied. A young doe was scheduled to die today, but without its mother, the baby will die. A replacement is needed. How can I ask another deer to die unexpectedly today instead? It is my decision. Therefore, I will die. I cannot kill you, said the king. For your bravery and compassion, I promise never to kill any of the deer in the park again. That is good for us, said Banyan. But what of the deer in the forest? I promise to never hunt them again. What of the other four-footed animals, our friends? I will not hunt them. What about the birds in the sky? 
I will not hunt them. What of the fish in the sea? I will not hunt them. All of the people in the kingdom followed suit. The animals were happy to be hunted no more. Now that the kingdom depended on the harvest from the fields, the farmer's land was respected. The park was now a special place where the king could stroll and seek guidance from Banyan, which he did for many years to come. So ends the story. And our nursery care providers, Danny and Doreen, and I believe Matt McPartland are also ready to take any uh, children who are present outside at this time for activities this morning. Let's sing together this little light of mine. This little light of I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. and spoken milestones. No. I have a I have a milestone to add um, or a check-in. It's delightful to see all of you. I saw you, Sue Tarshish. I saw you, Bob Bollinger. I saw Doris out in California. And I'm sure there'd be others, but right now there are just people as a banner across the top of my screen. Um, I'll look at you later when I'm not talking. And I have a poem to share for, in addition, silent reflection. This is by my friend and colleague, Ted Tollefson, in memory of his friend, Tim. When a bear comes out of the forest, it's often in search of sweetness, berries left on a bush, honey hidden in an ivory comb, fresh salmon or trout. If you're adopted into a bear clan, your job is to bring medicine to those who are sick. Healing touch or a hug works wonders. For those that are sad, a kind word or twinkling eyes will do. And if you walk this road with a good heart, you learn that nothing is stronger than kindness shared. We gain by giving with an open hand, like a river empties itself into the fresh water inland sea. Let us be silent for a time. Let it be, and join now in the hymn of reflection, Spirit of Life.
shape of justice who told me close queen set me free spirit of love come to me come to me The reading this morning is from Will and Ariel Durant. Civilization stream with tanks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing things historians usually record, while on the banks, unnoticed, people build homes, make love, raise children, sing songs write poetry, and even whittle statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happens on the banks. Historians are pessimists, pessimists because they ignore the banks of the river. It is now time for our congregational offering. If you are with us for the first time, your presence is our gift to us, your gift to us. Members and friends online, please express your generosity by using the link or QR code found on the screen or in the chat. If you prefer, you may send a check to UUCD at 24 Clappard Ridge Road, Danbury, 06811. Thank you for doing your part to support and sustain this community we love. again. I wish I were there with you. What happened here? Uh -huh. Phew. I mean, I would know how to say, I wish you were there with you. I remember you, da 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 da. But, you know, when it disappears, it's disconcerting. Okay. <laughs> okay. I saw others of you too. Marie Dupree, I saw. Sue Tarshish, I saw. Um, I need more pictures, I guess, for later. All right. Um, these memories of your faces uh, are among my personal history of this congregation. I remember my first Thanksgiving with you. Maybe some of you will remember these too. Outside the window behind the altar, we could see that across the road, a deer was visiting us. He looked at us. We all watched until he walked away. It was a part of the service. And then we went on with the rest of the service. It was a small gift to us. The Christmas tree was always a fine production. Grown-ups brought the tree in. Some years they brought it from Seabury and Eleanor Lyons Place in Bethel. 
The children made the decorations and hanged them on the tree, and the tree was always wonderful. And then the same group took the tree out, spreading needles everywhere, and there was a vacuuming crew after that. <laughs> then there was the year or two we lighted individual candles and set them in a tilted frame that was lined with foil to catch the drips, not figuring on the close placement of six inch candles would create heat that melted their neighbors. That was fun. <laughs> Someone had placed a bucket of water nearby and uh, that, that uh, soothed to some of the people who were wor worried we would set the place on fire. <laughs> um, we did that one more time, uh, lit candles, not set it on fire, and the water bucket <laughs> was nearby. Uh, it may be around this time that someone reminded me that the lovely walls were built over 100 years ago of chestnut, worn smooth by the backs of cows rubbing against them, and that if the, we lit them on fire, I would be responsible. <laughs> I remember the Halloween I dressed up in a panda costume and crept out of the bamboo thicket. No one seemed to notice. Too bad, I was a really good panda. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the first bread communion. The first, not the last, the first. Probably around Thanksgiving when bread was passed in a basket to be broken and held until all could share. It proceeded. Two men in the back row shook their heads after they received the basket and refused to eat the bread. We should have cut the bread into manageable cubes rather than my insisting on the symbolism of each one taking their piece from the common loaf. By the time the loaves had reached the men in the back row, the bread was filthy. <laughs> Live and learn. <laughs> Over the years, I have kept up with how you're doing. I'm so proud that you moved to the hill you're on there in Danbury. It was more than a twinkle in your eyes <clears throat> when I served there. And I'm happy for you that you were able to make it happen. I never doubted that you would. This congregation has always had dreamers and doers, artists and technicians, teachers and engineers, musicians and writers, and so many contributors of talent and knowledge and resources. I'm proud of you. I'm proud I was part of your growth. History writ large can be impersonal and public. It may be acknowledged by a people to be a record of what has happened to them. Remembrances of people and events may be the whole truth and it may not. As I wrote these words, people in New York and Pennsylvania and everywhere were remembering what happened on September 11th, 21 years ago, where they were, what they saw, whom they lost, and what all that has meant since for the United States, both good and bad. Current writings about those previously enslaved by their descendants are the necessary correctives of histories that never told the whole stories about those lives and the lives of the founders of this country. Corrected histories are moving up the banks to take their place where the people live and remember stories told to them. It is a stream with banks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing things historians usually record. But on the banks, unnoticed, people are building their homes, making love, raising children, singing their songs, writing poetry, and even whittling statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happens on the banks. Historians are pessimists because they ignore the banks of the river. Imagine now that you are on the banks looking down at the river of history flowing by below. You don't even have to work very hard, do you? It's coming at us every day fast and furiously. And I can't help but translate big public events into what I imagine are the lives of people living inside those events. Photographs of people on the banks stay with me. The ruins of everywhere in Ukraine stay with me. 
At first, there was only the one picture that the news kept returning to, that the top of the, a corner of a building was bombed and fell off before our eyes 20 times a day. And then more images were beginning to come in as reporters uh, sent them. I can remember uh, uh, some of them. A few have really stuck with me. That long line of people of all ages crossing a flooding stream, walking with things they brought from home, walking carefully on sagging wood planks. Chef Andre before an immense cauldron of thick soup, continuing to feed refugees, millions of them, just over the border in Poland. This is life on the banks where human beings live life at a human pace in a human scale. And, and another photograph in the middle of other mounds of mounds of rubble, perhaps uh, the remains of their school. May, young men students stood dressed for classes. And another high on a pile of rubble, a teenage girl balanced herself wearing a bright red ankle length dress. She balanced on broken hunks of concrete. She was dressed for prom. Those pictures from huge events happening down in the river valley bring home to us up here on the banks what people have lived through and are continuing to live through. Much of the history that goes on down in the river is written by journalists whose job, I think, it seems to tell to sell newspapers or increasingly to sell products advertised between TV segments and tweets and Facebook and Instagram posts. Up on the banks, on rubble left by the passing river surging waters, young men dress for classes and she dressed for prom. Life goes on. It was difficult for me long ago to understand history in school. Then I thought of history as monarchs and massacres, nothing to do with me or anyone I knew until while on a university class tour of a VA hospital, I came face to face with a veteran I had known in high school. He was in a line with other men. I called his name. He looked at me, he turned around and looked at me, but his expression was blank as if he didn't know who I was. This was early in the 70s, the last years of Vietnam War. That moment haunted me for a long time. I wondered about him for years after that. Decades later, I did run into him again at my mom's local grocery store. I was visiting my mother and I'd gone shopping for her. I called his name uncertain and he turned around and looked at me. And as I introduced myself, he smiled a little. And after we talked for a while, he said, you were nice to me in high school. You were the only one. I don't remember high school, let alone being nice to John, a slow talking, <clears throat> slow moving guy whose face is all I remembered, its expression not very lively, just sadness. I remember the war and seeing John at the VA. I remember the history of that war in small pieces, but here in John was a part of its living legacy. He had come out of that story down there flowing by us so fast and was making a life up on the banks, on the banks of my hometown. He was remembering a kindness from when we were teenagers, a smile and a hello in the corridor maybe, or a wave from the school bus. I don't remember what it might have been, but he did. I was a part of his history. And there was that shy, sad smile on his face, John at the VA and John in the grocery store, now part of my history. He comes to mind every once in a while, staring wordlessly at me in the hospital and smiling at the grocery store aisle. Part of my history too. Now I look at what is happening down there in all that is flowing by and it is much the same as before, monarchs and massacres. I am, consum I am a consumer of news. 
even the later in the day programs that have very few new refinements on previous hour shows. I watch and I watch. There's rarely anything breaking, although the banner continually posts breaking news in big letters. Maybe you have your own headlines you watch. I worry about Ukraine and I worry when Zelensky goes anywhere near the front. I know someone who died of COVID and I wonder how everyone I know is getting through this pandemic. I listen religiously to the slow moving apparatus following the former guy. War and crime are interesting and no more interesting than when their aggressors and perpetrators get what they deserve. I used to love to watch stories about the mob. I'm still watching and I'm waiting for comeuppance. Sometimes watching these stories becomes taxing. It's so slow to move on. I found this online one day. Sometimes I just wanted to stop. Talk of COVID, protest, looting, brutality. I lose my way, become convinced that this new normal is real life. But then I meet an 87 year old man who talks of living through polio, diphtheria, Vietnam protests, and yet is still enchanted with life. He seemed surprised when I said that 2020 must be especially challenging for him. No, he said, slowly, looking me straight in the eyes. I learned a long time ago not to see the world through the printed headlines. I see the world through the people that surround me. I see the world with the realization that love is big. Therefore, I just choose to write my own headlines. Husband loves wife today. <laughs> Family drops everything to come to grandma's bedside. He takes my hand. Old man makes new friend. <laughs> His words collide with my worries freeing them from the tether I had been holding tight. My headline now reads, woman overwhelmed by the spirit of kindness, our capacity to love is never ending. Woman meets new friend. It seems like small stuff, doesn't it? Just a woman and an old man talking up on the bank, but I'll tell you, it's not small stuff. Headlines are telling us what we should care about, worry about. Chirons are telling us to worry about things we cannot change, cannot even comment on to anyone else. I do yell. I do curse at the television. That probably does not help, not one bit, not me, not them. And then I go make dinner. And that's the thing. That's the thing. After we slog around down near the Roiling River, seeing the rafts of bodies and buildings and all sorts of frightening and sordid events and stories that go rushing by, knowing their names or not, knowing nothing about their lives, or as in 9-11, knowing everything about their lives, we walk back up the banks and we go to our hearth fires and we make our dinner. It's all too much or it is not enough. We can't unsee those images and we cannot undo what happens in the vast tumbling flow of history of civilization rumbling loudly by before our lives down there. We feed ourselves, we feed our families so we can go on another day, so they can go on another day. We also play with the little ones. We get out the big puzzle. We put the crayons and watercolors and brushes on the table so we can create something. And then we put the finished art up on the fridge. We look at homework, the kids or our own. This ordinary activity, this routine, ordinary stuff is the material of culture, of civilization. And men with tiki torches in Charlottesville insurrectionists on the steps and halls and chambers of the Capitol, policemen shooting men of color in the back, kneeling on the neck of George Floyd and 
politicians, God love them, saying this is not us. Of course, this is us. Our imperfect union with history submerged under the gloss or dug under with lies. But it is also putting one foot in front of the other that is civilization, slogging up the hills, up those banks to get home, doing the daily work to form a more perfect union, to call to others down below, to reach out to others reaching for us. It is ours to remind ourselves and each other of the inherent worth of each of us, of the promise of all the children and youth and the human dignity of every person. That's what you do here. That is what I remember from when I was privileged to serve as your minister. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury is an open religious community that welcomes a diversity of people, ideas, and beliefs. We celebrate together that which is good in life and offer comfort and care in times of need. With others, we work to create a just society and sustainable earth. We stand as a beacon for independent thought and encourage lifelong spiritual and intellectual exploration. So you are creating civilization right here on these banks. I am glad I was fortunate to spend seven years with you. I'm glad I'm still in touch with some of you. I'm so glad to see your faces this morning. I'm glad you keep moving on together and with others to create a better Danbury and a better world. I'm ending my message with the last part of a poem, Transcendental Etude by Adrian Rich, that I came to love 40 some years ago. It is also in the back of our gray hymnal. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Amen. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. And uh, if we could all come together and sing a hymn of celebration number 347, Gather the Spirit. Gather the spirit, harvest the power, our separate fires will kindle one flame. Witness the mystery of this hour, our trials this light appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit of heart and mind. The soul we my lay in store, nurtured in love and conscience refined, with body and spirit united. 
stood up into the morning light and spoke to those who had come back to the river. Now we have come again to this place. My life apart from you is not as strong. Yes, I have danced and I have told the stories at my own fire and I have sung well to all the directions. But when I am with you, my friends, I know better who it is in me that sings. Let it be. Mm -hmm. 